Welcome back, everyone. Well, we have a great guest today, Michael Szynski. He's a retired homicide detective at the city of Seattle, and he's got a fabulous book I highly recommend called Seattle's Jungle Killer. It's going to be a wild story, folks, so hang tight. He's a true crime author. You can see the book right there. There it is. And you're going to be able to access that anywhere, I'm assuming. But let's welcome Michael to the show. We'll find out more about it. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you for being here. Uh, Michael, they can get your book anywhere, correct? Amazon anywhere? It's not only on Amazon right now. Okay. So perfect. Seattle's Jungle Killer, folks. I highly recommend it. It's a really fascinating story. We're going to find out more about it today. Of course, we're only going to hit the tip of the iceberg. We're not going to get everything. Uh, there's a lot more in the book, but let's see what we find out. So, Michael, start us off. What's going on here? Oh, I'm just kind of chilling. I'm happily retired. And... Um... My book, uh, doing some work on my, my book and write, writing another book also. And oh, wow. uh, I, well, my plan was to write uh, uh, fiction to nonfiction, fiction to nonfiction, balance back and forth. People ask me and all the time about when's my next book, uh, which murder is going to be. Because I was a cold case detective, as you know, for many years. And I worked, um, I convicted seven serial murderers, and, which is... So someone told me as like one of the you know the leading detectives that right, convicted that many guys. I just yeah. had to be in the right place at the right time. It wasn't that they think that was a good detective? <laughs> no. They're just coming out, you know, when the most of yeah, cold cases, uh, DNA cases were um, were solved for murders that happened before 2020 and as old as you know 1960. So let's get started with the Seattle Jungle Killer or, or Chili Willie. He's got like three different names. The Seattle Shoelace Slasher, Chili Willie. You can look these up. So who is this guy? Um, Chili uh, was from back east. I forgot which city he was in. And uh, just drifted, drifted over to Seattle. And um, then he, he would start his murders in the 90s that we know of. And uh, what he did a bunch of rapes also, uh, and big strong guy, good looking man, um, but complete a complete sociopath. And uh, it created it created quite a scare here in Seattle for a short time. It took me about a year and a half to find him. A year and a half, wow. Yeah, well, it took about a year and a half. It was in 1997, uh, September 12th, I think is when the, my, got called the first, the first murder. Okay. And, uh, that was Denise Harris? Yeah, Denise Harris, yes. And no relation to him. And uh, that's when we first looked at the, he had his signature. A lot of these uh, serial killers have a signature. And his was using the, this, the victim's shoelaces to tie them up. But he tied them up usually after they were murdered. Because when after I first, they were murdered, after they murdered, yeah, he was. It was just something he would do. He'd get into like a trance-like state. And uh, did he rape them after as well? Was he a necrophilia? No, no, no. He was in. A, he would have sex with them, but like he told me, he goes, "I, I, I don't rape any of them girls. They gave it to me." And he's right. They did. Because they're they're they going to do it to get the drugs. And then after that, then he had the reason why to kill him. He'd, he'd strangle them, uh, tie them up with their shoelaces. And he'd be like in a trance-like state when he'd be telling me this. All of a sudden, his voice would get real deep. And he says, you know, in his hands, he'd be manipulating his hands. I had been a waist chain. And he'd be manipulating his hand, putting his hands like around their throat and talking. And they'd be, you know, saying things to me like, you don't have to do this. He says, oh, you shut up, bitch. I'll tell you what, and you can talk, you know. He'd strangle him, and uh, he just was completely, completely friggin' nuts. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, like completely, it. Completely nuts. And so, but that was his signature, was tying them up with the shoelaces, and every one of the people we found, they had their, they were tied up with their shoelaces. They had either a, a, a brassiere or a, a, a belt around their throat, and he gagged them also. But it was always the shoelaces. And so it sounds like he was, he, he manipulated them to come to where he was. 
and then he used he coerced them into sex. He, so he didn't didn't forcefully do this. Did he have force with them? Did he force them to have sex physically, or did he actually nope. just psychologically manipulate them? It sounds like. Nope, the, that was the part of the deal. They wanted to, they wanted some of his crack cocaine, or and uh, so they go to his place. They'd call the jungle, and a place right off of uh, right next to downtown here. And there was a lot of heavy foliage and uh, transient camps there. And like he told me, I said, why'd you bring to the jungle, Chili? He said, because they can't hear you scream. Uh -huh. Literally, when you'd be out there, you was right next to downtown, right next to the uh, I-5 freeway. It was so loud, the cars going by there, we'd be talking loud for each other, you know, here. But it was also very, uh, say, very woodsy and, um, but yeah, they couldn't hear him scream. And he'd have his way. He'd have sex with them. They'd have some drugs. And then he would, he'd call it, then I'd steal on them. Turn, hit them. And he was a big, strong guy. And then uh, when he'd, then he'd string them, then, then, then he would tie them up um, afterwards. And uh, so we found the niece, the first one, when I'm looking at her on the ground, her hands are about this far apart. I don't know if you can see the ground. Sure. And I'm looking and I'm wondering, I'm asking myself, why do you tie somebody up anyway? To restrict their movement, right? Sure. They're going to be like this in front of you or like, you know, behind their back. But I'm thinking, what, do you do that to carry them or something? Why would you keep somebody with their hands that far apart? But that's, he'd be in a trance like state, tying them up, pulling the shoelaces out. And before I forget this, uh, the last girl that he killed, um, Olivia Smith, he that got behind her, girl, right? Yeah, he got behind her and uh, he pulls a knife out and she starts fighting. She pulls a knife out and she cuts his hand really bad across thing. And when we're looking at the, we're watching, looking at, we're at the scene, looking at the, 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 the wounds on her, he slashed her throat, stabbed her numerous times in the chest and then also stabbed her in the buttocks, you know, very slight superficial type wounds. And um, why would somebody do that? And we've, then we found a mixture of his blood there also. But it was like 12 degrees outside. And uh, it was my, my it turned out to be my, later on my partner's case, Cloyd Steiger. And um, looking at that, thinking, well, why would somebody stab like that? Then her shoelaces, her shoes were off her and the shoelaces were just partially pulled out. Well, he was bleeding so much from the from the wound in his hand, and it was so cold out, he thought he was gonna pass out, so he had to stop. And that was the last murder he committed, then he took off and he did a robbery, and that's when he got arrested for a robbery. The robbery. So let's kind of stop, go back a little bit, and look at the, the methodology, it sounds like, because I know there's a couple of different things you guys will look at, you guys being detect homicide detectives. You got a point of contact. Where was he usually meeting these individuals? Do we have a, a, a typical meeting place or they're all very? Um, most of them were, they're all around the Pioneer Square <laughs> in downtown Seattle. Okay. Um, and a couple a couple bars around there and, and the street there and um, where a lot of the transients are, transients are at. And um, drugs are usually, you know, drugs and alcohol. And then um, the point of attack was all of them at the same place, the I-5? Oh, no, the jungle is actually, we only found one of them, Denise Harris, the first one in the jungle. The other two we found right on the outskirts of the jungle. But it was like a triangle. They were all within one mile of each other. So he attacked them in the same place, but the disposal sites changed? Well, the disposal sites were usually right where he did the, the murder. Oh, okay. Well, the one was in the jungle. And uh, he tied up, dragged her a short distance. Um, Olivia Smith was in a stairwell right next to the jungle. I mean, I, you, you could sit there, you could be in one spot and see the, see all of the other crime scenes from where you're at. And the other one um, uh, was right next to, right next to uh, um, the freeway, uh, I-90 I freeway. And he, we found her remains and she was decomposed already. Oh, wow. 
Now, you know better than I would. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, with the jungle, but was there a lot of a police presence there before him or is, nobody really ever came there? No, just transients that would live there. And yeah. um, they would just, they, they thought that this is their home because see most transients that are in mental issues, they cannot be like downtown around all these other transients, around thugs and all that kind of stuff. They'll, they'll end up killing somebody real quick. They could be by themselves, and that's where we th they'd be happy up there in the jungle, you know, doing their thing. We, you know, it's spooky as hell. I mean, oh it's really? Spooky. Oh God, you go up there talking to these guys, you know, and they you know their eyes are shifting. They're looking around. They want to be by themselves, you know. Yeah, I, this is my property. I live here, and um, and that's where you find bad things happen when someone else, regular hoods, and that come up there and start messing with these guys. Someone's gonna get stabbed. Someone's gonna get killed. And, uh, but people go up there and they party sometimes, you know, more like street people, transient type people. That's the only, any, I always said any, any woman who goes up to that type of place should be expected not to come out of there. Oh, wow. No, there's, there's no way. I mean, Does it I, change at all? Oh yeah. We, well, we, well things kind of shifted in Seattle here now. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, be yeah. beautiful. Seattle was beautiful. And now it's, it's, it's really bad uh, what happened to downtown Seattle. And uh, so we fenced it off with a nice little park up there and stuff. But right on the outskirts of it, you know, it's like 10 cities and stuff and transients and the drug use and stuff. It's, it's, it's horrid. It is just horrid, you know. It costs us about $100,000 and $200,000 every time uh, they have to go clean it up. Whoa! Oh, yeah, the trash and stuff, and uh, then they, then we just move them over to the next spot, you know. And uh, then we have these. Some of our city council people think, you know, you shouldn't should do anything to let the homeless go wherever they want to go. Well, they come downtown, and um, so downtown is not quite what it used to be. Yeah, and then it starts affecting the revenues, and the revenues start affecting business oh. owners who start leaving, and then city council all of a sudden gets a eye opener. <laughs> Yeah, well, our uh, city council is a little bit different uh, here. It's, uh, mm. But that's not a story. <laughs> yeah, let me go back to the. Uh, we'll go back to the Seattle Jungle Killer. Do you know anything about his background? Did you learn anything about uh, his background? Yeah, he, he. I forgot which city he lived in uh, back east, um, but he moved over here in uh, in the early eighties. Um, How about his early not early eighties, uh, late eighties? How about his childhood? Did you get anything on his childhood at all? Or? I talked to a sister of his one time, and every time we tried to talk to him, he'd, he'd lie about it, you know. At one point, he's telling me he was in the military and all this type of stuff, and um, I'm thinking, hey, there's no way in hell this, the military let this guy in there with his criminal history kind of stuff. And uh, so he'd make stuff up all the time. <clears throat> but most of the time, though, he was, in, he was in jail a lot, and then um, – in the 90s, early 90s is when he got came out to Seattle and uh, Seattle, Seattle area. And that's when he started getting arrested a little bit more often. And he would go out with um, men as well as women. And the men, he was doing it to, uh, to rob them. But he, I'm sure he, did, he had some relations with them also, but uh, he would go anywhere just to get drugs and um, control people complete sociopath oh absolutely um i'm trying to think now in regards to serial killers we know there's there's different things they do one of the things uh, we said we tied them up you raped them we know that he seems to be following a similar mo which is usually homeless or transients because they're not identified that easily people don't notice them missing unfortunately right. in that jungle area too which is another common tactic too because nobody's going to go looking in there for a long time if they ever do and no one's going to report a lot of these people missing um you know they all have they usually have warrants you know, they're their street they, they had a dangerous lifestyle anyway and any any well any prostitute does have a dangerous lifestyle especially these street ones um that they're taking this kept using those type of drugs um it was nobody's going to report them missing for quite a while denise harris she, I had to go talk to her um, boyfriend 
and interviewed him because I didn't know if he was a suspect or not. So we go to her house, me and my partner, my late partner, Dick Gagden, who's passed away. Um, knock on the door and uh, tell him who we are and that. And he just looks at me and he says, she's dead, isn't she? Whoa. Um, yes, she is. And so he goes, come on in. So he gives the whole story and uh, she'd come home and uh, she was she was a school teacher at one point, second oh, wow. grade. And, uh, but then she had a drug problem. Oh. And um, good looking woman, um, but she liked to, to she started drinking, get drunk, and then go start hanging on the bars, getting crack cocaine, and then just really s selling herself, not for money, but just for the drugs. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, and because once I'm looking at them, because I'm looking at her when I, when I we found her body, and I'm thinking, what's this woman? Yeah, she doesn't fit here. I mean, she's clean looking, you know, and stuff, and uh, didn't fit to be in there in the jungle. Um, but, you know, crack cocaine is uh, very addictive, and people do anything for it. Now, were well, the ethnicities different? Were they all the same ethnicity? Um, Indian and Native American. Olivia Smith was a little Native American. Uh, TJ was uh, half white, half uh, African American, and so was uh, Denise, half white. Okay, interesting. So we see, okay, so a little bit of a pattern there, not as much. Age differences were quite a bit. They had almost a decade apart each. Yeah, yeah. But what they had all in common was they were both, uh, they, they were all three of them were uh, in the drugs. Into drugs. That was the minimum. In, in well, in the crack cocaine. Um, Any stuff. And uh, crack cocaine, and um, I know Olivia and uh, and Denise. They're also drinking very heavily. In fact, when I was tracking down Denise, I had to go to all these bars downtown Seattle. Yeah, she was here that night. Yeah, she was here that night. Yeah, but wouldn't serve her. She was drunk. She was nasty. And they would tell me, yeah, she'd come in here and stuff, I'd be really quiet. And she smoked these, these uh, European cigarettes, you know. These people would tell me that she thinks she was such hot shit. And wouldn't talk to people or talk down to the bartenders and stuff. And just sit there and start getting loaded. And then um, then the guys would come around and she'd find out which guys had cocaine. They'd go out, smoke some, come back in, drink some more. And then she'd get nasty. She'd always get nasty with the bar help and stuff. And uh, they'd say, okay, get out of here. You know, you're... You're out of here. And, uh, and she thought she was, you know, she thought she was a queen that they're demonstrating how she'd walk and she had this real long, thick ponytail and swinging around. And she'd stop as she's leaving the door and flip, flip off the, the people. And um, it was, it was bizarre. It was bizarre. Yeah. We don't want to ruin it for everybody else too. We got so much more on this story. Michael, what was the one thing, you know, you interviewed him. Uh, what's, what, anything that stood out for you during your interviews with him? Um, well, he contacted me. Uh, he was in jail for a robbery. And he called me up, as we have some people call you up, and he wanted to get out of jail. He's in jail for like an armed robbery. I go, you ain't good. He goes, I'll tell you about that girl, because I, I was up there when she got killed. I was with the guy who killed her. I said, yeah, uh, who, yeah who was the guy we were with? He gives you some name of some guy that we hunted down and it was all bullshit. Um, he goes, Are you, I, I'll tell you something, it's not in the paper though. You never retrieved her purse, did you? And he was right. We never got her purse. He goes, this, this kind of purse she had. And so you get me out of jail here. I'll take you to where that purse was at. I'll get you her purse and I'll tell you who the guy was. And uh, so we were playing that game for a little while and then um, finally, after we pulled a couple st stunts, making stuff up, and I knew it was bullshit, he called apologetic, and we took him out of jail. And uh, he brought me to the he brought me to the jungle, and almost right where Denise was at found. And he goes, "Yeah, it was right around here and stuff." And her, I said, "Which way was her head pointed? This way and her feet this way?" And he goes, "Matter of fact." which is something I should have sent to you. Um, there was, a, uh, there was a, a beer can 
he was impaled on a tree. And I hit my, I got up and I hit my head. I said, mother, uh, hit my head. And I, well, we got a picture of that. When we, when we were processing the crime scene, I told uh, one of the detectives, take a picture of that can of beer, that beer can impaled there. He goes, why? We got all these enough pictures already. I said, maybe it'll come on handy. Well, so I knew he was at the scene. I knew he was there just from, from about that beer can being up there. And um, so that, that, that's, how, that's how it truly was. It's funny. So it's little things like that sometimes that'll really get you, you know, but he got the little thing to get me going by saying that we didn't get the purse. And um, which we never really did ever find it. He ended up throwing it in a sewer or something like that. Oh, man. It's amazing how the, even the smallest little things, a beer can stuck in a tree, can make all yeah. the difference in the world. And you just kept, you know, I took him out of jail, myself and a couple of detectives. And uh, every day for like about three weeks straight. And so some, some weekends I wouldn't take him out. I had to be home because I was working, you know, 15 hour days every day, you know, for months. Um, the money is good, you know, but after all, you just, you know, oh man, I just got, I got to get away from this guy, you know, I got to get off of this case. Um, one time it was on, on a Labor Day or Memorial Day, um, I was checking my phone messages and he'd call me up all the time, all the time he's calling me. And I get this message, he said, hey, uh, Mikey, Mike, he's calling me Mikey, Mike, Mikey, Mike, uh, this is chilly. Yeah, it's a holiday. You're probably off today. Well, uh, I just wanted to, you know, tell you, have a nice holiday, man. I'll see you, uh, see you tomorrow. So I, I played, the, played the recording for my wife. I said, now, when was the last time a serial murderer told you to have a nice day, huh? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Well, he's about what now? He's 57, 58? 58 years old now, yeah. When's the last time you spoke with him? I spoke on the, uh, the day I retired, um, the day before I retired. I went to, a, I had to go interview another murderer and uh, at the penitentiary. And I said, I want to see, see Chile. So they brought him in. He gained about, you know, I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He gained about 40 pounds. He set up those big old, big glasses, you know. And he's calling me Mikey Mike all the time. Mikey Mike, yeah. He goes, yeah, where's your, he goes, oh, I see you dressed in nice. I always dressed in a suit and all that kind of stuff. And um, he goes, yeah, you always dress, you always dress sharp, man. I got to say that. I used to dress sharp too, man. I used to dress up like that, which I knew was bullshit. He never, he always had fatigues on and stuff like that. But he pictured himself as that, as a kind of a dapper dude. So uh, I said, I'm just trying to, I knew I'd come and visit you, Chili. So I wanted to talk to you. And he goes, uh, where's your buddy Steger? He's called Steger. He's called him Steger. I said, I, I said he's working another case, but uh, he can't make any sense of regards. Yeah, I bet he does. He didn't, he didn't like Floyd very much. Um, he, gravitated, <laughs> he gravitated toward me, and, uh, which for, for whatever reason. Uh, when he confessed, uh, he confessed, uh, he first confessed to me. And that was, um, we were going to go out to the jungle. And uh, he was going to show us where some other bodies were buried. And we'd bring him up, we'd bring up there, give him a cup of, he called it a cappuccino. Uh, you, you want some coffee? I give him a cappuccinos, Mikey, Mike. And we get him, I give him a magazine, I have a sports illustrated or something, you know, and uh, he'd sit down there, give him cigarettes, he'd smoke, read magazines, so those guys will get that in jail, in county jail, and uh, give him his coffee or his cappuccino, and he was happy as luck, he's out of jail, because the guys that are sitting in county jail, they're bored, they're bored, jealous, because there's no, they don't do any, they don't have any jobs, you know, they get fat because they get the three meals a day. They get maybe 30 minutes that go exercise. And uh, most county jails don't have weights anymore. They did all that of, there's no cigarettes in county jail anymore, which is kind of a, it's a good, bad thing for us. It's not like these guys that go, I just go talk to guys that say, well, you ain't saying nothing. I go, okay, do you smoke? Yeah, I smoke. And I go, hey, would you want to come, come with me? Well, why do you ask me if I smoke? I said, well, if you come to me, I'm going to bring you back over to my office. I just want to talk about this, what happened. 
you, know, you can, I'll give you some smokes, get a can of soda if you want, you know. Yeah, right, man, I, I want to tell you what happened. They just want to have cigarettes. <laughs> so that works out pretty good, you know, so I let them smoke their heart's content, you know. Same thing with chili, you know, you'd sit there and you'd smoke away <laughs> and uh, read, his, read his magazine. And uh, so we're going to get him out of jail and uh, we're going to go take another little visit during the whole three weeks. And he says to me, he says, Mikey, Mike, I'm tired. I'm tired of doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I killed them bitches. And that also bitch that, that, that Livia Smith too. At first I didn't connect the Livia Smith case to his. And oh. uh, so I walked out and told my partner did gagged and he's walked around getting ready to go out to the field to go look for more bodies. I said, he just confessed to me. And um, call Steiger if he's at the dentist's office right now and tell him that you better get in here or we're gonna start taking statements from him about the murders he did. And then that's how we, that's how it went. Then that's how it went from there. He'd still wow. do, some, he'd still do some lying because it was the field trip for him, you know. Sure. Now, now every day, now it's more serious. Now every day I'm taking him out, you know, get him his cappuccino, get him hot dogs, all this kind of stuff, and uh, he's eating good. And I'm, and we're dropping him off, you know, in the evening and stuff. Um, see you tomorrow, man. And he call me up every single day, and. I, I get 15 messages sometimes. Oh, Jesus Christ. I got to go through every one of these messages. <laughs> um, but it, it worked out in the long run. Awesome. An amazing story. People don't realize the, the, the real life of a homicide detective is quite different than what you see on yes. TV, folks. <laughs> it's quite different. Michael, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you for having me. Again, folks, the book, Seattle's Jungle Killer, Michael Cezinski, C-I-E-S-Y-N-S-K-I. I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating story. Like I said, we just touched the tip of the tie. You can see it there. If you're listening to us on our podcast, you can get it on Amazon. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can get it on Amazon. Either way, thank you again, Michael, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, and I can be on the show again sometime. Oh, absolutely. And thank you, everyone, for listening as well. If you want to support our podcast, make sure to share and subscribe. We truly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.